Okay, I'm back. Eh, careful. It's the presidential side. They must be having a meeting or something in the uh, Southeast Asia Korea galleries, kind of right there in the middle. I'll take a tour, take you through a tour of that when I go down. And we'll do the other side there, space. Let's see. Almost 3,000 steps already. It shows I've already done two floors, but I haven't yet. At least, you know, stairs. That's what they should mark it as. But, oh well. Okay, let's walk down so we can get at least that part. They're doing some cleaning over there. So, all right, here we go. There's one flight. Uh, this one here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 16, 17, 18. And then we are here, before I go over there, got a Minuteman 2 trainer. It's used to instruct intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, launch crews, keep them proficient in the enormous responsibility of operating nuclear missiles. Some diagrams and stuff. They're mostly out west. And for a while, uh, Bill and I were watching a uh, YouTube channel, and they've restored or made a uh, missile bunker into a like a hotel type thing and I believe it was in one of the Dakotas I'm not for sure I'd have to go back and look that's kind of a timeline back in 58 61 first successful test flight 62 operational 150 Minutemen 1A and 650 1B deployed in 16 squadrons. 66 Minutemen 2 operational. Uh, 450 deployed in 9 squadrons. 69 last Minutemen replaced by Minutemen 2. And so forth. Got last one is in 08. 450 of the 3 operational. Cut out of the site plan. And underground. Only the president could authorize a strategic missile launch. Took less than five minutes. Step one uh, receives a warning from NORAD. Alerts the president. The president execute an appropriate response. Step two, combat crew in the launch control center hears an alarm, then receives a coded message. Step three, strap in their chairs in case of a nuclear strike. In the launch facility, they insert keys. Begin the final countdown as commander calls out 
codes. Dobby repeats them. Then launch. They had some women in the thing and they launched it in the test launch. Didn't say what year. Here's a side from the view from the side. Kind of replace them with all women. Okay. Under down here. I'm gonna come back. It's building four. Military and space, or research and development. Ah, oh, that's cool. Kind of what the guy was telling me about. But we're not gonna be here for that. I hope they show it on Facebook or their YouTube channel. But that would be cool. Exit over here, so this time closed. This is kind of like a classroom of sorts. Chairs are allowed on all available all parts of the exhibit. Uh, no museum electric carts. Ramps are compliant. Uh, stores are allowed on the ramps. Open trap pods are not allowed on the upper deck. Please, uh, okay. Hopefully, it's going to be all right. grip, I guess. I guess more water here in a minute. I'll keep my mouth shut. Where's your friend says, zip it. So we did that. We went for a half hour flight over Disneyland and back. As I was growing up, we heard lots of fighter airplanes pass overhead that were going supersonic, and I heard some explosions. Yeah, I think I can take these social distance stickers down.
because it was too big to go up in an expendable booster. It could only get there in the back of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And it got pushed back on the manifest several different times. And by the time they had room to fly in 1988, the technology had blown right past it. Mm -hmm. So the technology had gotten your little handheld camera there is about 10,000 times more sensitive than the chip in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this was the very first use of a charge coupled device is now the part of all our little video cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to believe something yeah. that big fit in something like yeah. that. To that big. Yeah. And this, the other thing, this is going to be innovative thing, the big thing sticking out of the side over here, the black uh -huh. was going to be the first ion engine to be used on a spacecraft uh -huh. for station keeping. Rather than using hydrazine jets, which they'd used prior to this, this was using mercury vapor ions with a charged grid at the front that would shoot those out and uh, help it hold its place. And that's now pretty much the standard, although they mainly use xenon, I think, now. Yeah. This was going to be... Innovated for its time, 1978. Mm-hmm. Just never made it. Yeah. So they kept it on the shelf for 30 years, plugged it in. It's the first time they'd ever had to keep a satellite for 30 years out of the 60-some life of the space age. Mm -hmm. Plugged it in, it still worked, and then they gave it to us. So that was what it proved. You can store a satellite safely for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's been here how many years? Uh, let's see, this opened in 16, so okay. seven coming up on seven now. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the cool things here, I got to meet one of the gentlemen who designed the plastic that the telescope is made out of. Because uh -huh. they needed a plastic that would not outgas in the space environment this was going to be in and get the gas deposited on the lenses of the telescope. So he helped design this plastic and because this whole thing was classified, he'd never actually gotten to see it until he finally got to see it here. Mm. He went off to other projects and uh, this is the first time he got to see it. Uh. I've been coming up here Let's see. since maybe 05, okay. give or take. Mm. On either side, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where are you visiting from? Uh, we're in Mansfield. Oh, that's where I grew up. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're kind of between Mansfield, Lexington, Belleville. In that oh, area. okay. Well, I was just up there on Saturday. Okay. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've got. A friend who's not doing well but lives on McElroy Road over okay. near the Madison High School. Yeah. And uh, that's where I went to school was Madison. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we go to church over there on the Lincoln Heights. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, like he lives right next to Mayflower United, or now it's congregation, but that's where I went. Okay, I know what that is. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like I live over in Columbus now. Okay. So. Yeah, still driving it for you. Huh? Still a drive, pretty good. Yeah, I mean it's it's actually it's 76 miles door to door to get over here. Okay. And geez, to where I used to live over at Ancient Road is only 70, so it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little closer to go up there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That's it's. I love doing this though. I mean, you get to meet. So many new people, there's mm -hmm. so many good stories and yeah. things, and then pass on some of this stuff that I've been putting in my brain for the last 60 years. Yeah. And <laughs> finally get to tell it to people who might actually care. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so, any tie-ins with aviation or anything? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, both my mom and my husband had their... Pilot's license before they had the driver's license. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow.
I learned to fly there at Mansfield. I got my ground school. I was at Ohio State, and my dad had a plane we were kept there at Mansfield, and uh, he had a friend there who was an instructor, and he had a uh, Citabria with a stick, high wing, tail dragger, and he thought I should learn to fly in the Citabria, so that's what I learned in. Okay. And got my private there at Mansfield. Uh -huh. And then went on to be an air traffic controller. Okay. And, uh, did that. Started out in Minneapolis and then Detroit and finally got back home to Columbus in 88 and was there for 23 years till okay. retiring. Yeah, my husband was from Ashland. Ah. And so. Uh... Well, I've got a friend of mine who started with me at the FAA Academy and went on to be a controller up at Cleveland Center in Oberlin. And he had been a pilot before that and he kept flying, kept current, and he ended up retiring the first day he could at age 50 and went back to flying for the airlines. Mm -hmm. And he ended up flying for, um, oh, for, well, it became U.S. Air. Okay. Anyway, and eventually American. But his son had been flying through this whole time, and he ended up flying as co-pilot for his son uh -huh. occasionally. Cool. And he lives right near the airport at Ashland. Okay. So, good yeah. Good hey, morning. Welcome. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. Hi. Satellite.